May the light of Christ shine in our hearts this day. Well, greetings in Christ. First, UMC friends and family, it is a joy and a privilege to be worshiping with you here in our sanctuary virtually once again. Though we are not gathering in person just yet, I'd like to welcome you to worship this morning. If you have not already done so at this time, I would invite you to say hello in the comment box on your screen. Let us know you're joining us or perhaps from where. If you're new or checking us out for the first time, we welcome you as well. We'd also like to extend a welcome to those watching on New Ulm Cable Access. We hope and pray that this service is a blessing to you regardless of how you're worshiping with us today. And so, friends, our opening hymn comes to us this morning from the faith we sing, number 2237, as a fire is meant for burning.
And so, friends, our call to worship today comes to us from Matthew chapter 22. As is our custom, we will recite this responsively, and you can do so as it appears on your screen. We are called to love the Lord our God. We are called to love with all our heart and soul. We are called to love the Lord our God. We are called to love with all our mind and strength. We are called to love the Lord, our God, and we are called to love our neighbor as ourselves. Come, let us love our God and share God's love in this time of worship. Amen. And so, friends, let us pray this unison prayer as it appears on your screen together. Let us pray. Almighty God, increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. Our first reading today comes in the New Testament in the book of Thessalonians. We are in chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. Let us open our hearts and our minds to hear the word of the Lord. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we already suffered and had been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, As you know, we had this courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. 
So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. And so our next song comes to us from Worship and Song, number 3105, In Christ Alone. As we continue, our second reading is also in the New Testament, the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 to 46. The greatest commandment. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, 
Which commandment in the law is the greatest? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered there, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. So Jesus said to them, How is it then that David, by the Spirit, calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This is the word for his people. Let our hearts and mind be open to the revealing of this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Have you ever, ever read or listened to the Chronicles of Narnia series by C.S. Lewis? I've been slowly reading them over the course of the past few years. It's the story of four children, Peter and Edmund and Susan and Lucy, the Pavensies, who have adventures in a magical and alternate place called Narnia, and their encounters with Aslan, the creator and king of Narnia, who also happens to be a lion. It was written as a sort of allegory with many Christian themes playing out over the course of these books and ultimately wrestling with the idea, the question of good and evil. To me, it's a wonderfully creative way of presenting some of the themes and ideas we find in scripture, sacrificial love, spiritual growth, and the like. Anyway, in the fifth book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treater, there's a scene where the children, along with others, find themselves on a boat in the middle of a dark mist. And in the midst of not really being able to see much of anything, being surrounded by darkness, Aslan the lion appears to Lucy, the youngest of the Pavensi children, in the darkness of the mist and whispers to her, Courage, dear heart as a means of encouragement and to remind her to not fear the darkness that she found herself in. Consequently enough, not half a page or a page later, the children find themselves once again in broad daylight. And the book even speaks of that serving as a reminder that there's nothing to fear but fear itself. And this is, interestingly enough, where we pick up our scripture text for today from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, where the Apostle Paul is describing his ministry to the Thessalonians. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as, as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. 
And so as Paul speaks of courage, courage to proclaim the gospel to the Thessalonians in spite of great opposition, I'm struck by how much having courage in the face of opposition strikes a chord with me in the time and place we find ourselves in right now. But I'm also fascinated by what it means to have courage, what it is, but also what it looks like. And after doing some research into the Greek and in, through my Bible dictionary, I came to discover that courage speaks to the idea of spiritual and emotional and moral fortitude to speak and act without fear in the face of obstacles or dangers. In Greek philosophy, courage was a cardinal virtue and seen as something that an individual can naturally and independently build. Now contrast that with courage in the Bible, which is rooted in believing and hope of divine companionship and help. And you see the difference is the source from where the, where the courage comes from. Does it come from within, or is it rooted in companionship in the other and the hope of God's help? I'm reminded of the psalmist who wrote in Psalm number 138, verse 4, When I called, you answered me. You made me bold and stout-hearted. I like that idea, stout-hearted. Because when we place our hope in God, we receive hope in God's presence in our life, as well as God's help. Which can lead us to having courage to do exactly as the Apostle Paul did, proclaim the gospel in spite of great opposition. But what does that look like, especially right now? Well, we get a clue a little later in the passage in verse 8. So deeply do we care for you, Paul writes, that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because, because you have become very dear to us. It strikes me that it's about relationship, friends, about sharing ourselves with one another. I would say we can do this in a number of different ways, whether it's through text messages or phone calls or cards to one another or letters, friends or family or fellow parishioners. Now, I've had the opportunity to, to correspond with a few of our assisted living and nursing home residents, and it has been such a joy to receive letters in the mail from them, hearing about what's going on in their lives, praying for them, and being able to listen to the parts of their lives and stories that they choose to share with me, and to be able to share some of my own as well. And so we come to our gospel text for this morning, from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 46, otherwise known as the greatest commandment. It goes a little something like this. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, he said, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now of all of the passages in the New Testament, perhaps this one is one of the most well-known after John 3.16. Because you see, Jesus is debating with the Pharisees, specifically a lawyer, as they ask him a trick question to test him. The text says that. And they ask him, teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? In other words, they want to know, out of the 613 different commandments in the Old Testament, which one's the most important? But Jesus knows his audience, and he knows 
They're trying to trick him. So he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, otherwise known as the Shema. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. You see, this Shema was actually central to Israelite liturgy, and it was transformed into a prayer. It was recited twice daily, in the morning and in the evening. But Jesus also cheats a little bit because he adds one. You could even maybe make the argument he adds two. And a second is like it. You shall love the Lord your God. Excuse me. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In a few simple statements, Jesus summarized all 600 and 13 commandments in the Old Testament, and sums them up not into the Ten Commandments, which we heard a few weeks ago, but into two. Love your God, love your neighbor as yourself. Seems simple enough, right? But I've found, maybe you can relate, simple doesn't always mean easy. Can I get an amen? And I don't know about anyone else, but these days... When our common rhetoric and news cycles seem to be adamant on dividing us into clear-cut groups where the similar-minded are welcomed by one another and those who think differently are shunned or condemned out of hand, I find myself asking the question, what does it look like to love my neighbor? Especially those neighbors who look or act or think or vote or worship or pray or work differently or who are different from me in some other capacity, regardless of whether those differences are big or small. Because, you see, Jesus' second commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves is not a conditional thing. Unfortunately for us, Jesus didn't say, love everyone who thinks like you and hate your enemies. No, instead, he said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. <laughs> there are no modifiers to the command to love your neighbor. So then who's our neighbor? Both in the physical sense, but also in the communal sense. You know, I'm reminded of one of my favorite... TV shows from when I was a kid, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And he framed the entirety of his show as being a neighbor to the kids that used to watch. And he, he understood his work as a Presbyterian minister and in his work in, in what, what, what's come to be called on-air ministry as being a neighbor to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of children and families all across America. So clearly, it doesn't necessarily have much to do with physical distance, right? Perhaps not only we can make the argument that our neighbor is not only the people we know, but also the people that we don't. The people in front of us at the checkout line at the store. The people, who pass on, we pay, the people we pass on the road, on the way to work or home from work, the people who make our takeout food or the cooks, the people who stock the shelves at Runnings or Walmart or Menards or Hy-Vee, who make our coffee at Lola's or our donuts at the Baccari. Baccari, excuse me. So how do we love them? What does that look like? Well, it's the same way we love ourselves, trying to make sure that their needs are met, showing kindness in a difficult season of life, being a listening ear to someone who might need it, offering prayer for someone who is struggling, writing cards or letters to someone who might just need a word of encouragement. But these are only a few ideas. There are many, many more. And I would even go so far as to say, not only do we need Neighborly love now more than ever, friends. Care and concern for one another. We need greater awareness of, God's, of how God is already at work in our midst. 
Because you see, I believe in order to love God well, we're called to love people well. And you can't have one without the other. It's like our founder, the Reverend John Wesley, once wrote, Though we may not think alike, may we not love alike. May it always be so. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this gift of Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, but also this greatest commandment from your son, Jesus, to love you with all we are and to love our neighbor as ourself. Show us the way. Help us to live into this idea more fully with each passing day, especially in these difficult days we find ourselves in. Lord, we love you and we thank you. Help us to love each person we come into contact with the way that you love us. In Jesus' name that we pray. And so, friends, as we respond to Christ's call this morning, let us pray together the prayers of the people as it appears on your screen. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for coming to us as a neighbor, a stranger, an immigrant, binding our wounds and carrying us to safety so that we might love you with all our heart, soul, and mind and welcome the stranger loving our neighbor as ourselves. And so as our Savior taught us, we pray now together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so, friends, now we come to the giving and serving part of our service. And as we do so, I'd like us to reflect upon the text once again from Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 45, where all the believers were together and in, in one place, and they sh sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And so, dear friends, at this time, let us worship God in our giving and our serving. I'd like to mention this week health care workers that are doing the work of caring for others all throughout this pandemic. To nurses and doctors and orderlies and nurses assistants and hospital chaplains everywhere, thank you for your service. I'd like to ask for continued prayers for Mara Friedrich as she recovers from her incident with um, earlier. And I'd like to pray especially for the, our folks in assisted living and in nursing homes here in New Ulm and everywhere as well. If you would like to do so, you are able to give on our website at firstumcnewulm.org through PayPal. You can also click the Shop Now button on our Facebook page, or you can mail your checks to the church here at 1 North Broadway here in New Ulm. And, and our, our secretary, Lorna, will take care of it for you. We thank you for your continued support. It is only through your continued giving that we are able to continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus here in New Ulm to our community. Thank you so much.
And so, friends, our closing hymn comes to us from the faith we sing this morning, number 2176, and it is Make Me a Servant. And so, friends in Christ, as we go forth now into God's service, receive this benediction as a blessing from God, who loves us and cares for us. Our benediction today comes to us from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord. Jesus Christ, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do this. Amen. Go in peace. God be with you. Amen.